Okay, so um, welcome everybody. This is Lena, one of the coordinators for the Bangalore Sustainability Forum. Um, BSF is an inter-institutional inter consortium to give space for multidisciplinary conversations around Bangalore's sustainable future. And um, in 2019, we started with the so-called Small Grants Program, which has the aim to foster small-scale collaborative approaches to look at different issues in, uh, related to sustainability in urban and peri-urban Bangalore. The first round of grantees are about to complete their work and so we would like to take a moment with them to reflect on their experience, their findings and their outlook from here. Today we welcome Nishan Srinivasaya and Anisha Jayadevan from the Frontiers Elephant Project, FEP, Srinivas from the Foundation for Ecological Research, Advocacy and Learning, FERAL, and Uma Ramakrishna from the National Center for Biological Sciences. With this, I hand it over to you. Hi, thanks, Lena, and uh, welcome all of you. Uh, it's, uh, it's kind of funny uh, to be interacting with friends uh, over uh, this, uh, this forum. Uh, I've known all of you uh, for a long time, uh, Anisha, uh, Srinivas, and um, Nishan, uh, I'm a big admirer of all of you. You inspire me uh, a lot. So I, I just wanted to start uh, first. Uh, start first by uh, actually asking uh, a question about what uh, what uh, prompted you to have this title for the project, uh, Zebra Crossing for Elephant. It's a very catchy title. So maybe we can start there. Nishan, maybe you can give us your thoughts on that. Hi, Uma, uh, and thanks so much, uh, everyone, uh, for having me here. Uh, like Uma was saying, it's great to at least see everyone again because it's been a long gap and we have not met. Um, but this is a great opportunity to catch up as well. And thanks, Uma, for your question. Uh, the title actually, uh, were the, the Elephants on the Zebra Crossing was given by Srini. So he'd be the better person to answer this question. Uh, but I think the idea was that uh, we were finding a lot of the individuals uh, that we study, especially the male elephants, about 50 to 60 of them, uh, who uh, were crossing uh, highways, crossing railway lines, um, and uh, walking under high tension wires, coming uh, close to villages, um, and also moving across crop fields, uh, and very often feeding from the crops that were available uh, in these crop fields. Uh, and we started seeing them more and more often and more frequently over the last uh, decade or so. And so we had been uh, thinking of uh, looking at how these elephants are in a way synergizing, in a way adjusting to the urban landscapes, uh, especially given that a lot of the elephants that we study uh, stay very close to urban centers, especially Bangalore. And a lot of the rural areas around Bangalore are transforming rapidly, they're becoming uh, urban, uh, they're becoming more peri-urban, uh, and so the elephants also seem to be displaying behaviors that are more compatible with, you know, what's happening in terms of the landscape and infrastructure change. But elephant on the zebra crossing itself, I think Shini, Shini will, will tell you why. I think uh, Nishant already gave out all the key ingredients, and uh, the idea was that uh, you don't have zebra crossing in rural uh, places. So we are saying if, if there's an elephant on a zebra crossing, either it's very close to human settlements, maybe urban or peri-urban. So we had some uh, very long title, if I remember, I don't uh, recollect what it was. And I kind of found it very boring and I said, how oh, about uh, we have a title which says elephant on the zebra crossing. Maybe it makes people think also, why do you have why would anybody want to see an elephant on a zebra crossing? So that's... Yeah, it's great. And it also captures, you know, this uh, kind of new phenomenon. And I know, Nishant, you've done work on this uh, before, uh, you know, about how, um, you know, when you think of elephants and you think of Bangalore, you don't think of the two together, right? Uh, and so in that sense, the same, uh, same kind of concept of an elephant on a zebra crossing, I hope our uh, viewers would be wondering why would that even uh, be the case but what was it that you uh, you were able to kind of 
so obviously, you know, you are, you, you, you've said a little bit about the vision and the motivation that you were uh, curious to understand what's going to happen to these animals uh, that are so close. Uh, and as land use is changing in greater Bangalore, uh, they are going to be impacted. Um, what were your, uh, in this, and it's a very short project, you know, uh, in the terms of time scale to understand these things. So it may be very premature uh, of me to jump the gun and ask you, but uh, have you had any learnings you think from this project so far? And what are they, if you could summarize, maybe uh, Nishant first and then Anisha, that would be really nice. Yeah, thanks, Uma. And um, so one of the things um, we're seeing, of course, is that uh, the elephants are definitely adapting, uh, like I said, to what's happening uh, around them. And this would be in terms of land use change, be it either, you know, uh, cropping changing from single cropping to multiple cropping that has happened in a lot of these areas and elephants have responded by staying in some of these uh, landscapes outside forested uh, habitats for longer periods of time which means there's more interaction with people there's more interaction with infrastructure and so you have elephants who uh, gradually tend to be okay and get habituated to being outside traditionally known forested habitats where we you know all think that elephants would and still to a large extent are seen um, but uh, as we uh, started looking at the elephants and the, the rate at which the behavioral adaptability is kicking in in the elephants is phenomenal and in in some sense it seems to be in proportion to the rapid changes that are happening in the landscape as well and so they are able to respond really quickly and during the uh, process of observations of these elephants itself we've now known uh, know that elephants you know if they want to take refuge they can probably come and plonk themselves in the middle of a large water body they don't need necessarily forest cover or small forest patches where they need to take refuge and this extreme adaptability is something that we wanted to capture in this project because bangalore like you said is changing so rapidly and its influence on the surrounding uh, uh, landscape and uh, the area also is quite tremendous. Um, so, so the first initial learning was how do these elephants take decisions while moving across uh, these, um, you know, changing areas? How do they cross roads, for example, or what makes them go into a crop field or avoid certain areas as well? And I think that's where we really started. And Anisha started looking at uh, how various um, factors can actually be quantified and what are the values that one should take into in order to build a model because we are really trying to build a predictive model which is as real as possible as we go forward and given that there is behavior involved as well there's constant learning that happens during this process so those models may change also uh, and so that is something that we had to keep in mind and and i think anisha would be in a better position to you know answer this and take it forward and say how we really use these values and went ahead Go ahead, Anisha. Thanks, Thanks Nishan. Thanks, Uma. Um, so maybe I can just quickly um, run everyone through the objectives that we had for the project and then show some of the outputs that we've started generating already. Uh, so there are just four broad objectives. The first is uh, we wanted to understand the factors that govern ranging patterns of elephants. Uh, in and around peri-urban areas of Bengaluru. Um, the second is where we're trying to feed in these factors that we get into the model that Nishant was mentioning. Um, so it's based on actual data of individual location points in the landscape. And this model will then predict how elephants are moving based on land use land cover in the current scenario, as well as in the future so we'd like to explore uh, three scenarios in the future. One where uh, land use land cover is projected based on past land use change. To account when we uh, take into account um, elements from the development plan. And the third uh, scenario is um, a combination of the first two scenarios but with the added component of mitigation structures. So for example, overpasses, 
uh, that allow greater movement of elephants, as well as uh, perhaps some mitigation measures that farmers can employ to reduce conflict. Um, so this last scenario will really help to understand the efficacy of some of these mitigation measures and to understand what happens to movement and conflict in the absence and presence of these um, mitigation measures. Uh, the third objective we had is to, um, to understand the trends and hotspots in uh, human elephant conflict. And this is based on data that has been already collected um, from many forest beats in Karnataka, where uh, people from Feral and the Frontier Elephant Program went and interviewed forest or beat watchers to ask them about historical movement data and historical conflict in their recent memory. Um, and the fourth is to incorporate the outputs from all of these objectives into a policy document that can aid urban planning. Uh, and also, of course, be of use to the forest department. So I'll just share my screen now uh, to show some of the um, results that we've got. Is it visible? Yes, yes, thanks. I just cut my okay. video because the internet was a bit unstable, yeah. Okay. Um, so, like I mentioned, our first objective was to understand what is governing um, elephant movement in the landscape. So what we did was uh, we took individual uh, elephant locations from 2009. Um, and we also took land use land cover data from the landscape. So by land use land cover data, I mean categories such as where forests are, where plantations are, where the water bodies are. And then we calculated um, something called contiguity for each of these land use land cover classes. So for example, we wanted to understand how contig continuous or contiguous uh, forest patches. So if forest patches are very uh, connected and contiguous, they get a value of contiguity closer to one, as opposed to very disconnected and isolated fragments, which get values closer to zero. And so we calculated these contiguity values for all the different land use land cover types, associated these values with the individual elephant locations. And we ran this data through a classification and regression tree to understand the probabilities of occurrence of elephants in different, um, in different land use land cover types. So I'll try to keep this simple and just quickly walk you through this. Um, so if you look at the leftmost branch of this tree, it tells you that in areas where contiguity of barren areas is less than or equal to 0.6, and where contiguity of scrub areas is less than or equal to zero, you see um, uh, that the probability of elephants occurring in um, category three, which is plantation, is about 80%. And so we did this for all the individuals in our study. So we have individual level probabilities of these elephants occurring in different land use land cover types, uh, depending on the contiguity uh, values in the landscape. And this is what we then fed into our model. So uh, we, we um, use something called an agent-based model, which lets you simulate movement and interactions. Um, and you can really make it as complex as you want to, want to make it. We used a software called NetLogo to do this. And so we could input layers on uh, the landscape, on, on the different land use land cover categories, as well as the different contiguity values. And then we, could, we seeded uh, elephants in this landscape and then the elephants, uh, the individuals take decisions on where to move to next based on the underlying contiguity values. So this is just a quick video to show everyone what that looks like. So the black triangle that's moving is an individual elephant that's moving in the dark green area, which is a forest. 
There are some gray areas which are barren areas. The yellow is plantation, uh, sorry, the yellow is agriculture and the light green is um, plantation. So here um, the elephant is moving, taking into account the underlying contiguity values. And this will repeat um, for many iterations. We actually wanted it to repeat for five years, which is the amount of time it takes for an elephant to settle. Um, and we also really wanted to include this component, which is a sort of exploratory behavior of elephants to find new crop fields. And elephants also uh, visit crop fields more at night when conflict is likely to be uh, reduced. So that's what this video shows, where the elephant starts off moving in um, agricultural field, which is yellow, uh, and then it's moving into the forest during the day. And then it moves back to the agricultural field at night. Um, so this is just some of the, some of the exploratory behavior we wanted to incorporate where um, as individuals start exploring the landscapes, landscape, they start to understand more and more about where the different agricultural fields are. And so then they can visit those agricultural fields um, more often. Um, <clears throat> this, is, uh, this is a map that uh, answers one of our um, Third objectives where we wanted to understand the trends in human elephant conflict in the landscape. Um, so this is based on interviews with forest watchers. And so it's a heat map that just tells you the number of instances of overlap in different kinds of conflict. For example, um, human injury, elephant injury, crop damage, property damage. Um, and there is a whole lot of other data as well to explore in the form of these heat maps. For example, uh, different kinds of human activities such as firewood collection and NPFP. And so all of this together will give a really nice baseline, we think, um, about human elephant conflict as well as movement in this region. Um, and the last thing I wanted to show you is um, from a manuscript that's almost ready, where we wanted to uh, understand how habitat selection of elephants changes as they move from a high um, forest contiguity area such as Banagata National Park to low forest contiguity areas such as Tumkur. And we found something really fascinating, which is that in, in low forest contiguity areas where there's very little forest cover available for refuge, uh, elephants are selecting water bodies, W, uh, much more based on their availability in the landscape. And this is in contrast to uh, high contiguity areas during the day and night, where elephants are, as you would expect, found more in forests or F, yeah. Um, so this is, again, something that will be really useful to add to the policy document, especially because um, uh, the forest department is planning to construct more water bodies and there's more irrigation uh, being planned in um, regions like Kolar. And that will actually have the unintended consequence of bringing in more elephants and possibly leading to more conflict um, in the area. So that's all from me. Srini, would you like to add something? Not much at uh, this stage because I think a lot of these uh, outputs will actually start making more sense when we run the simulations for longer uh, time. So we're just, I think uh, Anisha is just waiting for a couple of layers to get updated and uh, run it. But what I'm guessing is um, when the scenarios comes in, that's when it gets uh, really interesting. So right now it might uh, just look like a more refined version of uh, some of the work we have done earlier. Uh, 
defined as in, in, in spatial resolution and both maybe in uh, temporal resolution. So we will get some more finer detailed uh, movement pathways and things like that as compared to our earlier work, but uh, it will really get interesting once you start plugging in these scenarios. Either let more urbanization, more traffic, reduce traffic, having fences, and um, what, like what Anisha was saying is, in one of the BSF meetings, which was on water, there was a whole focus of uh, decentralizing water for Bangalore, which involves uh, reviving tanks, lakes, maybe even gray water tanks and things like that. So that means we're gonna have more water bodies in and around Bangalore. Now, are there going to be unintended uh, consequences of this well-meaning effort? I'm not saying well, Bangalore does not need water, we all know, but uh, there could be a flip side. So we really don't know. And I am looking forward to seeing those results. And uh, yeah, and especially the master plans. So like, um, mm -hmm. Our uh, land use change model might not capture everything. It might just show how urbanization is going to increase and things like that. But specifics of maybe there might be a more focus uh, in the master plan on places like Nelmangla and uh, mm -hmm. maybe Kengeri and things like that, which regular projections of future land use might not pick. And yeah. plugging in those specifically is going to be very interesting. So actually, I have a few questions, if that's okay. I, and I want to just, uh, so just to, just to summarize where we are here, I mean, I'm not taking away from uh, what you guys have said. You know, you have data on individual elephants. It's a very a different perspective. You know, we're not looking at the whole population. You're starting at the level of individuals, monitoring their movement, using learnings from that to infer probabilities of transitions between these different types of habitats that you have which surround us and then you're saying okay now we have these individuals and their probabilities of moving here and there should the land use change should the sorry the land use and the distribution of these landscape elements change how does that change how elephants will interact with these landscapes that's what Srinu was talking about the scenarios am i right in kind of capturing that uh, and you've used agent-based models. So there's very nice and very interesting threads of the conversation, which are relevant very broadly today. You've used these uh, agent-based modeling approaches, which, for example, are generalizable when we're talking today about the pandemic. People are talking about models and spread, right? Uh, and you're also um, looking at trade-offs. So the fact that, you know, on one hand, uh, uh, one uh, kind of sector of society may say we need more water bodies to uh, deal with the fact that Bangalore is going to be whatever water zero what is it called something like that no water in two years or whatever but at the same time that may have unintended consequences of increasing uh, because these are attractors for elephants they may end up having uh, unintended con consequences of increasing conflict so something which seems uh, you know, if you just uh, maybe talk about this uh, to someone on the street, like you're just watching elephants uh, is actually something which has impacts on policy of how we plan our urban spaces, right? So I think I, I think that's a really beautiful point and I hope the viewers uh, can get that connect. Uh, and that connect comes through models, right? The ability to model behavior and for individuals and individuals in this landscape. Now, one quick question I have is, you don't, you have, you know, uh, how you said 50 individuals? I'm sorry, I missed that. How many yes, individual, individual elephants were you tracking here? 50, 50 individuals, 50. yeah. So, um, so given, given that you, uh, Nishant, you yourself mentioned about, you know, behavioral uh, repertoire of elephants and uh, how resilient elephants are in terms of behavior, and one of the things I admire about you a lot is you've spent time as a maho. So you've really interacted with elephants uh, and their behavior, really, you know, hands on. Do you think that this might, the fact that they're such individuals, uh, will that affect your predictions? Because you have 50 individuals. Those individuals have personalities and uh, that's what drives their behavioral choices. And they may also change, right? So uh, how robust do you think your predictions might be, given that you're not talking about tigers, which are like blobs, I mean, sorry to say, 
elephants are behavioral they are you know they have a, a lot of rich behavior uh, so this is something i'm always curious about so i'm i'm i'd love to hear from you guys what do you think yeah thanks uma and and i think you sort of uh, hit the nail on the head and uh, the whole idea of starting with the individuals as a starting point in fact was to uh, in a way embrace uh this diversity in uh, individuals across elephants so we're not looking at elephants as elephants but we're looking at them as individuals and so by embracing this idea that an individual could change its behavior or could respond and act accordingly uh we have i think tried to what we're trying to do is incorporate what these individuals might do at the population level be it the age or the sex of the individual or the physiological state for example when they come into must and not in must or the body condition of the animal and also base it on our long term behavioral observations on these individual elephants which has helped us sort of understand as to what their personalities in some sense are for example we know that uh, and this is what we sort of recently showed with the formation of the all male groups uh is that a lot of the learning could be happening between the older and the younger males and so when they meet or associate a lot of this information which is there can be passed on to certain other individuals as well and some of this behavior could also be about how to feed from crop fields how to cross a fence or how to cross a six lane highway uh and things like this and while we talk a lot about you know how they might explore the habitat i think one of the places we want to really want to take this project is also to see how we can bring in learning models and say okay if it's not just exploratory but it's uh, not trial and error but it's based on pre-existing knowledge of one individual which can be passed on to the others then can we have can we see patterns developing and the whole idea of pitting the elephants and the behavior with the infrastructure change that's happening is to really move towards i think what is now a human centric design to a non human centric design and see if while we plan the landscapes while we plan infrastructure and development can we have at the back of our mind or not necessarily at the back of the mind now but now right in front of us a model which says okay if we act like this then this is how the elephants might respond so how do we modify our behaviors in order to make it more compatible with that of the elephant use in the area so i think that's really where we want to take the project to make it more non human centric and bring in elephants in wildlife and elephants become a, a, a sort of a a key species when we talk about generally wildlife also because like you said right at the beginning no one imagines an elephant in in bangalore city and and given that uh, bangalore city might go into a lockdown or whatever people might not be around uh, not on the highways it's only a matter of time that i think an elephant might want to walk into a, a lane in bangalore they have already already been on the in on the infrastructure corridor which none of us expected uh, they have they do keep coming into the what is now the urban area of bangalore although right on the fringes of the center of the city uh so this might happen over time and this is something that we need to plan be prepared anticipate and i think need, we need to take our measures or whatever it is it could be uh education and awareness it could be mitigation measures it could be informing certain development projects a classic one would be you know filling up tanks with large uh, with large tanks with water because already we know elephants are coming in towards kolar we know they're coming in towards malwood so if they find water in these water bodies they might just plunk themselves there so if we if we can take this information to a larger area from where we think elephants are today then we we are building resilience of people towards you know having elephants in the landscape in the long run so that's that's great i mean i guess you know the one of the nice one of the goals of bsf is really to encourage people to step out of their silos uh, and to interact and uh, you know collaborate with uh, people whom they may not do so normally so do you feel that um, you guys in this project have um, you know ended up do you feel that there were other disciplines say that maybe were missing uh, or uh, people whom you think would be good to have on a team because this is clearly very interdisciplinary you're talking about animal behavior you're talking about land use change landscape uh, planning 
uh, at the same time, you know, wildlife conflict and also behavioral change. Uh, if you want us, Nishant, to change how we react uh, and have uh, share space with elephants, uh, even in, uh, in a megapolis like Bangalore. Um, so I think uh, I'm just curious to know what you guys think about um, the future of these kinds of studies uh, and your study in particular, whether it would be good to have, say, a, you know, a, a land use planner, an architect or, you know, uh, someone else, a, a sociologist or uh, uh, who else uh, would be great to have on a team uh, doing such work. Okay, I can start by uh, answering very briefly and then Srini and Anisha, I'm sure, will have a lot more to say. Uh, one the, the ways we've looked at this whole elephant movement is, uh, uh, for me, it's very satisfying because we've let the elephants roam, uh, given this, there are certain rules that they follow to move around, which might change, but we have fixed right now how they could or probably take decisions based on whatever knowledge we have of the elephants and at the individual level. And as and when they bump into various actors, uh, you know, a highway, a water body, uh, maybe a building, maybe a fence, I think it'll, it'll, it'll take us to various departments or institutes or actors or, you know, so that's how we build this entire complex model, I think. And it was great to start with BSF because that's where the genesis of this project happened because there were so many ideas around. There were so many people talking about various things. And, and as we understand, and as we experience it while working with elephants especially, is that everyone wants to do what they could do best in their disciplines. So for example, the agriculture department wants to increase agricultural production. Uh, so they don't see if they, want, they should put sugarcane or banana in an elephant area or not. So, so the idea is that, each one of us have to uh, do best in our disciplines. And this really brings all of us together to, I think, pause and say, okay, can we really think of how we can actually look at various actors in this and see what might be the best outcome of a collaborative effort? And, and it's, it's unfortunate in some sense that the elements don't have their real voice here where they can come if they are very realistic or close to being realistic i think there's a good voice for the elephant there as well shrini and anisha anisha maybe shrini shrini do you want to go first or should no, I? no you go you go okay uh, no i think nishant put that really well and i just wanted to add that um, since we're using an agent-based model, we can actually make it as complicated as we want, want it to be. Uh, so we can really add a lot in terms of individual behavior, the landscape, uh, different actors such as the forest department and farmers. And so um, I think especially with the forest department, it would be really nice to see how this can be of more use to them. Um, for example, uh, we could have scenarios where elephants are taken out of the population uh, and see how that affects movement of other individuals and conflict. Um, so yeah, there's no end to how complex the model can be and how useful it can be. Srini? Uh, what? It's like, uh, you know Nishant, he's been with elephant for years. So things keep evolving and uh, what has been of interest is along with BSF, we also had some other uh, grants that came in to look at elephants and work with villagers and forest department and things like that. And uh, from our findings, we it has really given us some kind of a book to take to field and talk to people. So there is more confidence with which we can say, okay, if there is a fence, this is what is likely to happen. And if you dig a trench, nothing is likely to happen, so on and so forth. So some prescriptions are uh, being made. And uh, from a larger conservation and policy perspective, I guess we are getting some traction from different uh, departments. It could be, we have been approached by collectors, forest departments, and they are giving us inputs, asking us to go visit their sites, mm. see what we can recommend. So we don't recommend anything unless we can collect information, understand the situation, 
see what works or what won't work. So there has been some traction and I'm looking forward to having this project completed with some simple uh, reports which can be sent to various departments, maybe agricultural department, milk federations, district collectors, police, forest department, whoever. So in some sense, a non-scientific, but a science-based uh, report to various uh, departments would really help bringing these players together because they need to understand. They need to say, okay, we never thought this is likely to happen. Yeah. I think that's a great uh, insight. And I think, you know, um, we encounter it every day, you know, I think, especially in the context of environment, you know, and biodiversity, I feel like, uh, and wildlife also, a lot of people feel they know a lot or uh, things like that. But many times, you know, there's a lot of scientific uh, nuances and connections, which, uh, you know, local projects can really uh, illustrate and shed light on, uh, which actually, uh, would help people really uh, very tangibly, uh, which is very nice because many times we feel that, you know, science is so abstract. Um, but here you have an example of a project where you're actually doing agent based models, which can help uh, someone on the ground. And that's really, that's really cool. I think that's really nice. And it's great for us at BSF that we have the opportunity to facilitate that. So of course, the other question is, you know, do you guys, have you guys had faced any issues while doing this? Um, did you, did it, there, were there some setbacks uh, apart from, you know, I, I don't know whether you got a lot of good collaboration uh, and support from the forest department. Uh, how, how are things, how have things been in terms of implementation? Maybe Srini, you can start. I don't, uh, really does it's not working, things like that, but I wouldn't say we have had uh, major setbacks and uh, on a day-to-day -day basis, yes, I think we got uh, good support from forest department and uh, villagers who have been feeding us with information. And uh, I guess Nishant will be in a better position to give more details on. We have been collecting information and uh, on and behavior for some time now. So we did end up using a lot of that uh, behavioral data and, uh, um, you know, um, um, land, land use data uh, that was there. A whole lot of uh, work involved actually uh, desk-based and, uh, and uh, you know, um, thinking uh, uh, about how to model this and those involved conversations. And that is something that Anisha might uh, speak to us more about as to, what what she went through, uh, going through uh, the data sets and uh, modeling this whole thing. Uh, but of course, one thing that did happen over the last three months was that, uh, and I think most of us have experienced it, is that this whole corona virus thing has occupied our mind space. And we had to uh, see, um, because we are doing other things as well simultaneously, we had to think of how best we can uh, work around this and uh, try to keep things going. Um, uh, so I'll, I'll, I'll uh, leave Anisha to uh, uh, really uh, tell us what she uh, experienced while analyzing the data sets. The lockdown period where we couldn't go to office and so we didn't have access to any of the um, office systems for a long time. And so a lot of work had to be done on very bad home internet for quite a long time. Um, so we're slowly getting back to business as usual now. Uh, but it's, it's been a great experience um, looking at all the data that's been collected so far for, by Feral and Nishant and the Frontier Elephant Program. Um, and, and sometimes when you look at the elephant points in a map, it really brings home to you that they're in these extremely human dominated environments in uh, like a sea of agricultural fields with no forest in sight and they've crossed really busy highways to get there. Um, so it's been a really great experience so far. Yeah, that gives a very hopeful message in a way, you know, uh, and, and then it's basically down to how the future is going to be. How are we going to, this has happened. It has happened. It has, that's how it is today. 
but unless we change, uh, do these kinds of scenario modeling, think about behavioral change, uh, it may not stay that way. Uh, you know, there is some level at which there will be so much urbanization that it may not be possible, right, for elephants to be around with us. So that's really, that's really cool. I, I shouldn't have said setbacks. I guess I meant more challenges. Setback sounds very negative. Uh, but anyway, it's great to hear that uh, you were able to, and you got so much of uh, on ground, you know, a lot of villagers and so on who were helping and willing to help. And I know from interactions with all of you earlier, as Nishan said, that's also because you have been running a long-term study, right? And that's very important that we continue these uh, long-term studies going forward. Otherwise, uh, it's going to be hard to just, you know, we can't get data like this uh, in an instant, especially for long-lived uh, species like elephants. So, you know, one of the questions also, which a lot of people ask is, uh, you know, so many studies on elephants. I mean, this, I don't know whether you've experienced, but many times I ask, get asked, you're still working on the same thing. It's been 50, 20 years. And, uh, you know, probably till I die, I'll be working on the same thing. I don't think I'll figure it out. But, you know, uh, how come, uh, you know, when we're talking about science, we think about, you know, big generalizations. And yet, you know, especially in conservation, we tend to need to do local studies. So can you elaborate a little bit on why you feel, say, uh, there's a lot of studies on African elephants, for example. Why can't we just use the same you know, the same principles from there here. Um, and for example, this is relevant to a very local organization like BSF, which is Bangalore Sustainability Forum. Where we're really focusing on Bangalore, um, you know. So just some thoughts on that. Maybe uh, Nishant first, do you want to start? Can, yeah. Sure, I can start. Yeah. Thanks, Uma. That's a lovely uh, question, in fact. Uh, and, and I think to start with, it goes back to um, the individuals and uh, why we have uh, uh, decided to treat these elephants as individuals because um, they do respond to the local ecological and anthropogenic settings a lot more. And so uh, behavior of a certain set of individuals might be very different from that of another set of individuals somewhere else. And so it becomes, and, and so is the case with the people who live alongside elephants, their behaviors are very different from uh, another group or a set of uh, people and communities who might be living elsewhere. Uh, one of the things uh, you know we've gotten to see over a period of time is that uh, you know a large and drastic changes in uh, land use have happened within the lifespan of a single elephant. That's within the last 70 years, 60 years. Um, uh, some, in some cases, especially around Banagata, elephants have lost about 50% of the forest cover that was there around the 1940s. And this is a change that these elephants have seen, and they, there are individuals who continue to live in this landscape uh, and have seen this change. Uh, what has also happened in these um, uh, decades is that there are a number of calves who are born, and these calves have uh, grown in these areas knowing nothing else. Uh, other than, you know, the forest, uh, which they go and take refuge in, and the crop trees that they feed from, and the uh, highways that they cross, and the people that they interact with, uh, either running away or chasing, uh, a whole lot of things. So these elephants, in that sense, have seen much more than what, you know, their mothers or aunts or grandmothers had seen. And, and what has happened now is that these elephants are um, um, getting habituated. And so their threshold will only increase over time where they can push their own boundaries and say, how much more can I take this? And so in some sense, you have more and more elephants who are getting habituated to a changing landscape. At the same time, what has happened in the villages in rural areas, especially around a place like Bangalore, is that a lot of the young people in the village have moved out of the villages. There's been out migration. They've come into towns and cities for work. Uh, and so, uh, over time, they've also lost the ability to, in some sense, interact with these elephants because they're not, they're not seeing these elephants on a daily basis. They're not hearing their stories on a daily basis, which their parents, their mothers and fathers and grandfathers would, would know of. And so when they go back over the weekend or on a holiday or for a festival and you know, hear all of these stories that the grandparents and the fathers are saying and the mothers are saying uh, of how the elephant comes and fed on their crops, they are less a lot less lost less tolerant towards elephants than uh, you know their uh, forefathers were uh, and their mothers and grandmothers were 
so so it's important for us to i think take into consideration that uh, it's very uh, localized it's site specific uh, a lot of the mitigation measures that we uh, also sort of figure out after interacting with the individual elephants and the individual farmers that we work with is very localized it's sometimes very unique to that particular crop fields uh, and a crop field in fact and not to any other um, so we've been been able to take it to that level where it can be at a fine scale and we then build on it over time because we know where these individuals roam and so it becomes very very important i think to make these measures and whatever policy that we make uh, suit local uh, changes in anthropogenic settings and also landscape of course there is great potential i think uh, that we can take the same modeling approach to various other sites but that should include uh, the local individual elephants and the individual people there and the master plan that has been developed for those areas and that's when we really make a powerful impact i think so in that context then uh, you know how is this i mean it's fabulous but how is it scalable nishan because um you know there's elephants everywhere this is happening in jharkhand this is happening in chatisgarh this is happening everywhere right and there's not nishans and shrinis and anishas everywhere so yes. how can we scale this uh, and how can we bring local so that's often a problem which a lot of if you talk to bureaucrats or they say you know you can't scale this you cannot have local solutions so that's why that's the argument for the top down solutions which one right. says it's all so any thought on that i think we've been trying the other approach for some time now and although there have been successes uh we still haven't been able to address in that sense the elephant in the room sorry to use the phrase but then yeah so uh, but then so, so the approach now we're taking really would be to uh, see if it can be a bottom up and by bottom up i mean not just local communities by the local individual elephants and that's where it becomes challenging i think and you're absolutely right uma there is definitely it is definitely difficult to scale it uh, as a single thing across say south southeast asia or across india but i given the fact that there are a lot of studies that are happening on elephants like we started our discussion with a lot of people are actually looking into individual populations they they're looking at different areas and landscapes and if we can actually i think integrate a lot of these people who have worked on these elephants and bring in that in knowledge and information from these local sites to help us with you know feeding into our models i think that will be a great step forward um you think that there is a future then which does not which is not dominated by negative interactions with elephants i guess that's a hard question but um you do think that such a future exists and it can be facilitated by you know the kind of work you are doing but also maybe some local participation or how do you think such a future can be made a reality shall i take this yeah so i think i think there is hope there is definitely hope and uh, uh um we do uh, see a lot of change for example with the uh, local members and community members that we work with villages especially who seem to understand and are very curious also of the fact of what elephants can do so in fact a lot of them tell me when i go and when we all go to the farms is that they say you know don't talk to us about conflict we live it every day so you don't have to tell us about the conflict and we completely understand that and we are nobody to go and tell them you know the elephant will come and feed on your crop because it's not my crop i'm not living there and the elephants do what they do and the farmers are experiencing what they're going through but what they're really interested in in fact is uh, when we say you know an elephant can actually pick up your scent from almost a kilometer if the wind is in the right direction then they say oh is that what's happening is that probably why the elephant uh knew where i was sitting on the top of a tree that day i was wondering how it did it and so what the farmer says now i'll be careful i'll know i know now that the elephants can actually pick up my scent to find out where i am and not necessarily have to see me so these are interesting behavioral inputs that we are able to bring in i think and with these models we'll be able to inform more and what has happened to the locals uh, and the communities and the uh, administration there to say that this is how an elephant actually behaves and this is how you might want to respond 
And to a, a large extent now with these models, what is going to happen is, uh, view, I think we're going to bridge the divide that has been between the rural and the urban areas. Because the rural areas, a lot of times, just experience and uh, undergo changes that are forced upon them by the urban areas. You know, for example, uh, pumping water from a river to the city of Bangalore is a classic example of this. It's coming from where the rural areas are to an urban area to be used. But the impact of the urban area is being felt in the rural areas. And this is the divide we'll be able to build, a uh, bridge, sorry, uh, when we say, you know, if the urban area develops like this, this is the impact that's going to be that's going to happen in the rural areas too, and vice versa. So I think there's a lot more information that, that the community members can now use to guide their own policies or their own decisions at the local administration level, whether that pressure or uh, um, uh, you know, a, a dialogue or a narrative which can help them you know, uh, plan their future as well. Um, any, any, uh, uh, Lena, I mean, I think uh, we've asked lots of questions. I think maybe I'll just uh, give uh, Srini, Anisha, and, uh, Anisha and uh, Nishan a few minutes to kind of close, uh, maybe with closing thoughts. Does that sound good? Or Thank you. Sir. Closing thoughts, Anisha, on your experience. Uh, you know, you've, you've worked on, you've come into this from a, you know, modeling perspective, uh, but also behavioral ecology from your varied uh, you know, experience on small mammals and um, large uh, carnivores in central India and so on uh, in terms of modeling. So uh, any, uh, any kind of thoughts of how it felt different to be part of this project, uh, which is uh, funded by a different entity, BSF, you know, and their motivation. Um, and similarly for, uh, you know, Srini and Nishan. Maybe you can start Anisha. Sure. Yeah. Uh, thanks for your question, Uma. And uh, so I would say coming from, we just wrapped up a project where we did something similar with large mammals in central India and Western Ghats. But that was such a data deficient environment where we just had information on home range and dispersal distance. And so uh, we really had, had to figure out how to make it as realistic as possible in a very data deficient environment. So coming from there to here where we have individual level data on movement and behavior, um, I think it's a great learning experience to be able to do it at such a fine scale in such a rich uh, data environment. And I really look forward to uh, developing some of the future scenarios that uh, we've spoken about and to look at how the model will um, um, respond to those scenarios. Yeah, Srini? Personally, this has uh, been something that I always keep saying, the landscape is like a platform, which keeps changing on that you have populations, then you have dispersal, then you have individual, then you have behavior then you have drivers. So, and what happens is everything changes when the platform keeps changing. So the platform itself is dynamic. It's not static. So everything keeps bouncing, interactions change, some things might get disturbed or there might be more uh, cohesiveness. So we really don't know. And uh, this has been fun. So this is exactly what I wanted to do, where I could plug in different things and see how they interact and what is likely to happen. In that sense, this has been a fantastic uh, experience for me. Nishant? Yeah, thank you, Srini. Uh, yeah, it's been great fun. And, uh, uh, and uh, really would like to also thank uh, BSF and Wipro and all the others who've been, we've been interacting with Uma, in fact, uh, when we started uh, the first meeting on, in, at BSF. Um, thanks also to Lena and Mansi. Mansi, we have not, uh, I think, met uh, and interacted much, uh, but it's been a wonderful experience. Uh, it's something that uh, we have all looked forward to, and uh, we have uh, learned a lot uh, from the elephants and from the uh, the Asian-based models as well. So, in some sense, we are learning from uh, these 
uh, both very living beings and also the non-living ones. Uh, so it's been great. And uh, we hope to uh, sort of build on this, especially. And that's something that we are very keen on because we see a lot more collaborations. We see that uh, um, uh, a lot of the results that we may or the uh, the final, you know, uh, patterns that we, we may find would take us uh, to a lot of other actors and a lot of other people who we may need to interact with. And, and a whole lot of them are actually at BSF. And so it's a fantastic platform. Uh, and that's something that we really want to and are keen on building upon. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks for that. And I hope that we'll be able to actually, uh, uh, not us only, but all of, all of us together, collectively, um, somehow reach out to the policy makers, not in the wildlife sector, but really in the planning sector and uh, bring, uh, you know, these very, uh, these strong threads of, you know, uh, non-human centric approaches, modeling based assessments of scenarios uh, for the future uh, and incorporating, you know, varied uh, like stakeholders. Elephants are also stakeholders in the future of this landscape uh, and their, you know, possible futures in thinking about the future of this uh, urban, peri-urban and development um, uh, around us uh, because it is sure to impact us. And I think I'm, I'm hoping that BSF uh, will continue uh, through yours and other projects uh, funding such initiatives. So um, thanks a lot. I, I really had fun interacting with all of you. Um, and Lena, whether you have any other thoughts to add? Oh, no, I don't have any other thoughts uh, to add other than thanking you and thanking Nishant, Anisha and Srinivas for the wonderful work and for proposing the, um, the work to us. And we are really happy that it turned out so well. It's really exciting. And I think there's a lot of food for thought for our viewers. We hope and we will take an effort to take these conversations to relevant people. And yeah, we are really looking forward to see more impact of your work from this. So thank you all. Yeah, Len, I think yeah, also be, uh, it'll be important to try to brainstorm on how we can communicate these results because sometimes models and simulations are things like the people who get it love them, but it's hard for others to internalize and to, to really uh, understand they may switch off. So we'll have to think, uh, yeah. brainstorm together on that. that. That'll be really nice. Yes. Okay. Really great. Okay. Thanks again, everyone. And sorry, I had bad internet in the middle at times, but great to talk to you all and see you all. Thank you. Same here. Thank you very Thank much. You. Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.